This is section 31 of the $30,000 Bequest and Other Stories by Mark Twain. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. An Entertaining Article I take the following paragraph from an article in the Boston Advertiser. An English Critic on Mark Twain Perhaps the most successful flights of humor of Mark Twain have been descriptions of the persons who did not appreciate his humor at all. We have become familiar with the Californians who were thrilled with terror by his burlesque of a newspaper reporter's way of telling a story, and we have heard of the Pennsylvania clergyman who sadly returned his innocence abroad to the book agent with the remark that the man who could shed tears over the tomb of Adam must be an idiot. But Mark Twain may now add a much more glorious instance to his string of trophies. The Saturday Review, in its number of October 8th, reviews his book of travels, which has been republished in England, and reviews it seriously. We can imagine the delight of the humorist in reading this tribute to his power, and indeed it is so amusing in itself that he can hardly do better than reproduce the article in full in his next monthly memoranda. Publishing the above paragraph thus gives me a sort of authority for reproducing the Saturday Review's article in full in these pages. I dearly wanted to do it, for I cannot write anything half so delicious myself. If I had a cast-iron dog that could read this English criticism and preserve his austerity, I would drive him off the doorstep. From the London Saturday Review Reviews of New Books the Innocents Abroad, a book of travels, by Mark Twain, London, Houghton Publisher, 1870. Lord Macaulay died too soon. We never felt this so deeply as when we finished the last chapter of the above-named extravagant work. Macaulay died too soon, for none but he could mete out complete and comprehensive justice to the insolence, the impertinence, the presumption, the mendacity, and, above all, the majestic ignorance of this author. To say that The Innocents Abroad is a curious book would be to use the faintest language, would be to speak of the Matterhorn as a neat elevation, or of Niagara as being nice or pretty. Curious is too tame a word wherewith to describe the imposing insanity of this work. There is no word that is large enough or long enough, let us therefore photograph a passing glimpse of book and author and trust the rest to the reader let the cultivated english student of human nature picture to himself this mark twain as a person capable of doing the following described things and not only doing them but with incredible innocence printing them calmly and tranquilly in a book for instance he states that he entered a hairdresser's in paris to get shaved and the first rake the barber gave him with his razor, it loosened his hide and lifted him out of the chair. This is unquestionably exaggerated. In Florence he was so annoyed by beggars that he pretends to have seized and eaten one in a frantic spirit of revenge. There is, of course, no truth in this. He gives at full length a theatrical program seventeen or eighteen hundred years old, which he professes to have found in the ruins of the Colosseum, among the dirt and mold and rubbish. It is a sufficient comment upon this statement to remark that even a cast-iron program would not have lasted so long under such circumstances. In Greece he plainly betrays both fright and flight upon one occasion, but with frozen effrontery puts the latter in this falsely tamed form. We sidled toward the Piraeus sidled indeed he does not hesitate to intimate that at ephesus when his mules strayed from the proper course he got down took him under his arm carried him to the road again pointed him right remounted and went to sleep contentedly till it was time to restore the beast to the path once more he states that a growing youth among his ship's passengers was in the constant habit of appeasing his hunger with soap and oakum between meals in palestine he tells of ants that came eleven miles to spend the summer in the desert and brought their provisions with them 
yet he shows by his description of the country that the feat was an impossibility he mentions as if it were the most commonplace of matters that he cut a muslim in two in broad daylight in jerusalem with godfrey de bouillon's sword and would have shed more blood if he had had a graveyard of his own these statements are unworthy a moment's attention mr twain or any other foreigner who did such a thing in jerusalem would be mobbed and would infallibly lose his life but why go on why repeat more of his audacious and exasperating falsehoods let us close fittingly with this one he affirms that in the mosque of st sophia at constantinople i got my feet so stuck up with a complication of gums slime and general impurity that i wore out more than two thousand pair of boot-jacks getting my boots off that night and even then some christian hide peeled off with them it is monstrous such statements are simply lies there is no other name for them will the reader longer marvel at the brutal ignorance that pervades the american nation when we tell him that we are informed upon perfectly good authority that this extravagant compilation of falsehoods this exhaustless mine of stupendous lies this innocence abroad has actually been adopted by the schools and colleges of several of the states as a textbook but if his falsehoods are distressing his innocence and his ignorance are enough to make one burn the book and despise the author in one place he was so appalled at the sudden spectacle of a murdered man unveiled by the moonlight that he jumped out of the window going through sash and all and then remarks with the most childlike simplicity that he was not scared but was considerably agitated it puts us out of patience to note that the simpleton is densely unconscious that lucretia borgia ever existed off the stage he is vulgarly ignorant of all foreign languages but is frank enough to criticize the italians use of their own tongue he says they spell the name of their great painter vinci but pronounce it vinci and then adds with a naivete possible only to helpless ignorance foreigners always spell better than they pronounce in another place he commits the bald absurdity of putting the phrase tare an auns into an italian's mouth in rome he unhesitatingly believes the legend that st philip neri's heart was so inflamed with divine love that it burst his ribs believes it wholly because an author with a learned list of university degrees strung after his name endorses it otherwise says this gentle idiot i should have felt a curiosity to know what philip had for dinner our author makes a long fatiguing journey to the grotto del cane on purpose to test his poisoning powers on a dog and got elaborately ready for the experiment and then discovered that he had no dog a wiser person would have kept such a thing discreetly to himself but with this harmless creature everything comes out he hurts his foot in a rut two thousand years old in exhumed pompeii and presently when staring at one of the cinder-like corpses unearthed in the next square conceives the idea that maybe it is the remains of the ancient street commissioner and straightway his horror softens down to a sort of chirpy contentment with the condition of things in damascus he visits the well of ananias three thousand years old and is as surprised and delighted as a child to find that the water is as pure and fresh as if the well had been dug yesterday in the holy land he gags desperately at the hard arabic and hebrew biblical names and finally concludes to call them baldwinsville williamsburg and so on for convenience of spelling we have thus spoken freely of this man's stupefying simplicity and innocence but we cannot deal similarly with his colossal ignorance we do not know where to begin and if we knew where to begin we certainly would not know where to leave off we will give one specimen and one only he did not know until he got to rome that michael angelo was dead and then instead of crawling away and hiding his shameful ignorance somewhere he proceeds to express a pious grateful sort of satisfaction that he is gone and out of his troubles 
no the reader may seek out the author's exhibition of his uncultivation for himself the book is absolutely dangerous considering the magnitude and variety of its misstatements and the convincing confidence with which they are made and yet it is a textbook in the schools of america the poor blunderer mouses among the sublime creations of the old masters trying to acquire the elegant proficiency in art knowledge which he has a groping sort of comprehension is a proper thing for a travelled man to be able to display but what is the manner of his study and what is the progress he achieves to what extent does he familiarize himself with the great pictures of italy and what degree of appreciation does he arrive at read when we see a monk going about with a lion and looking up into heaven we know that that is st mark when we see a monk with a book and a pen looking tranquilly up to heaven trying to think of a word we know that that is st matthew when we see a monk sitting on a rock looking tranquilly up to heaven with a human skull beside him and without other baggage we know that that is st jerome because we know that he always went flying light in the matter of baggage when we see other monks looking tranquilly up to heaven but having no trademark we always ask who those parties are we do this because we humbly wish to learn he then enumerates the thousands and thousands of copies of these several pictures which he has seen and adds with accustomed simplicity that he feels encouraged to believe that when he has seen some more of each and had a larger experience he will eventually begin to take an absorbing interest in them the vulgar boor that we have shown this to be a remarkable book we think no one will deny that it is a pernicious book to place in the hands of the confiding and uninformed we think we have also shown that the book is a deliberate and wicked creation of a diseased mind is apparent upon every page having placed our judgment thus upon record let us close with what charity we can by remarking that even in this volume there is some good to be found for whenever the author talks of his own country and lets europe alone he never fails to make himself interesting and not only interesting but instructive no one can read without benefit his occasional chapters and paragraphs about life in the gold and silver mines of california and nevada about the indians of the plains and deserts of the west and their cannibalism about the raising of vegetables in kegs of gunpowder by the aid of two or three teaspoons of guano about the moving of small farms from place to place at night in wheelbarrows to avoid taxes and about a sort of cows and mules in the humboldt mines that climb down chimneys and disturb the people at night these matters are not only new but are well worth knowing it is a pity the author did not put in more of the same kind his book is well written and is exceedingly entertaining and so it just barely escaped being quite valuable also one month later latterly i have received several letters and see a number of newspaper paragraphs all upon a certain subject and all of about the same tenor i here give honest specimens one is from a new york paper one is from a letter from an old friend and one is from a letter from a new york publisher who is a stranger to me i humbly endeavor to make these bits toothsome with the remark that the article they are praising which appeared in the december galaxy and pretended to be a criticism from the london saturday review on my innocence abroad was written by myself every line of it the herald says the richest thing out is the serious critique in the london saturday review on mark twain's innocence abroad we thought before we read it that it must be serious as everybody said so and were even ready to shed a few tears but since perusing it we are bound to confess that next to mark twain's jumping frog it's the best bit of humor and sarcasm that we've come across in many a day i do not get a compliment like that every day i used to think that your writings were pretty good but after reading the criticism in the galaxy from the london review have discovered what an ass i must have been 
if suggestions are in order mine is that you put that article in your next edition of the innocents as an extra chapter if you are not afraid to put your own humor in competition with it it is as rich a thing as i ever read which is strong commendation from a book publisher the london reviewer my friend is not the stupid serious creature he pretends to be i think but on the contrary has a keen appreciation and enjoyment of your book as i read his article in the galaxy i could imagine him giving vent to many a hearty laugh but he is writing for catholics and established church people and high-toned antiquated conservative gentility whom it is a delight to him to help you shock while he pretends to shake his head with owlish density he is a magnificent humorist himself now that is graceful and handsome i take off my hat to my lifelong friend and comrade and with my feet together and my fingers spread over my heart i say in the language of alabama you do me proud i stand guilty of the authorship of the article but i did not mean any harm i saw by an item in the boston advertiser that a solemn serious critique on the english edition of my book had appeared in the london saturday review and the idea of such a literary breakfast by a stolid ponderous british ogre of the quill was too much for a naturally weak virtue and i went home and burlesqued it reveled in it i may say i never saw a copy of the real saturday review criticism until after my burlesque was written and mailed to the printer but when i did get hold of a copy i found it to be vulgar awkwardly written ill-natured and entirely serious and in earnest the gentleman who wrote the newspaper paragraph above quoted had not been misled as to its character if any man doubts my word now i will kill him no i will not kill him i will win his money i will bet him twenty to one and let any new york publisher hold the stakes that the statements i have above made as to the authorship of the article in question are entirely true perhaps i may get wealthy at this for i am willing to take all the bets that offer and if a man wants larger odds i will give him all he requires but he ought to find out whether i am betting on what is termed a sure thing or not before he ventures his money and he can do that by going to a public library and examining the london saturday review of october eighth which contains the real article bless me some people thought that i was the sold person p s i cannot resist the temptation to toss in this most savory thing of all this easy graceful philosophical disquisition with his happy chirping confidence it is from the cincinnati enquirer nothing is more uncertain than the value of a fine cigar nine smokers out of ten would prefer an ordinary domestic article three for a quarter to a fifty-cent partaga if kept in ignorance of the cost of the latter the flavor of the partaga is too delicate for palates that have been accustomed to connecticut seed leaf so it is with humor the finer it is in quality the more danger of its not being recognized at all even mark twain has been taken in by an english review of his innocence abroad mark twain is by no means a coarse humorist but the englishman's humor is so much finer than his that he mistakes it for solid earnest and laughs most consumedly a man who cannot learn stands in his own light hereafter when i write an article which i know to be good but which i may have reason to fear will not in some quarters be considered to amount to much coming from an american i will aver that an englishman wrote it and that it is copied from a london journal and then i will occupy a back seat and enjoy the cordial applause still later mark twain at last sees that the saturday review's criticism of his innocence abroad was not serious and he is intensely mortified at the thought of having been so badly sold he takes the only course left him and in the last galaxy claims that he wrote the criticism himself and published it in the galaxy to sell the public this is ingenious but unfortunately it is not true if any of our readers will take the trouble to call at this office we will show them the original article in the saturday review of october eighth which on comparison will be found to be identical with the one published in the galaxy 
the best thing for mark to do will be to admit that he was sold and say no more about it the above is from the cincinnati inquirer and is a falsehood come to the proof if the inquirer people through any agent will produce at the galaxy office a london saturday review of october eighth containing an article which on comparison will be found to be identical with the one published in the galaxy i will pay to that agent five hundred dollars cash moreover if at any specified time i fail to produce at the same place a copy of the london saturday review of october eighth containing a lengthy criticism upon the innocents abroad entirely different in every paragraph and sentence from the one i published in the galaxy i will pay to the inquirer agent another five hundred dollars cash i offer sheldon and company publishers five hundred broadway new york as my backers any one in new york authorized by the inquirer will receive prompt attention it is an easy and profitable way for the inquirer people to prove that they have not uttered a pitiful deliberate falsehood in the above paragraphs will they swallow that falsehood ignominiously or will they send an agent to the galaxy office i think the cincinnati inquirer must be edited by children end of section thirty one